Welcome to this afternoon's roundtable discussion, everybody. Sorry, we're starting a few minutes late there. We had uh, it's minor, minor technical hitches, which uh, they've, worked, they've worked themselves out for most of us. Um, but there's there's still a few a few niggles in uh, a few ghosts of the machine. So bear with us if there's anything uh, untoward happens. But uh, I'd like us to get underway um, because I'm cognizant we want to make sure, make good use of everybody's time across this hour that we have. So. This afternoon's roundtable discussion topic is why people are underrepresented in sustainability strategies and what fashion can do about it. Now, that's a bit of a loaded question, but it's an important one. Um, now, sustainability is on everyone's lips. Consumers, brands, investors, regulators, everyone's pursuing the same goal. And that's a model of fashion that doesn't harm the planet. But there's a critical distinction there between what sustainability is, the way it's spoken about today, and what it should be and what it could be. And the focus in the industry right now is very much on environmental issues as part of sustainability strategies, carbon footprints, material impact, waste, disposal, and so on. There are far fewer brands and retailers that are taking measurable action on humanitarian imperatives like fair wages for manufacturing operators now part of the reason for that is a part of the reason for that lack of action is a lack of awareness but a big part of that reason for that lack of action is a lack of data a lack of insight a lack of understanding into what it really means for sustainability to take full account of both planet and people. Now, that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be joined by a panel of experts who I know are all very passionate about this subject and each of them has a very thorough understanding of how the issues can actually be solved. So I'm gonna introduce everybody in a moment, um, alphabetically versus our name rather than playing favorites, um, after which we're gonna move into the roundtable discussion portion of this. Uh, now I've got a list of questions that I wanna ask, um, but I'd also like to point out that the chat should be open. So if anyone would like to ask a question of their own, please put it in there and we'll try and get across to it. Either we'll work it into the conversation as we go or we'll come back around to it at the end as well. Now, I'm actually first alphabetically, as luck would have it, um, but I'm not sure you need an introduction to me. If you signed up for this uh, discussion, if you're watching it live now, if you're watching the replay of this, then you know what the interline is, and you'll have seen enough of my face by now. Um, so I'll move on to introducing our other panel members. We have Mark Harrop, who is founder and CEO of Witch PLM. Um, he's worked for more than four decades from manufacturing to bleeding edge software. Um, he's worked tirelessly to further the cause of fashion technology. Next up, we have Rakil Hydramani. He's director of Hydramani Apparel. Um, he's an experienced director with a demonstrated history of working in the apparel and fashion industry. He has strong professional skills in garment manufacturing, apparel technologies, and international business development. Rakil's area of focus is on bridging the gap between manufacturing and technology, which is fortunately something we're going to get deep into today. Um, we were going to be joined by Stuart McCready Stocks, uh, who is the brand director for Coates Digital. Uh, unfortunately, he's the one who had some technology issues. He may, he may join us shortly. If he does, I will reintroduce him to everybody. Um, if he doesn't, just know that he, uh, he wished he could be here. And finally, we have Daniel Vaughn Whitehead, who's co-founder and chair of the Fair Wage Association. Um, Daniel's been working for European and international organizations, first at the European Commission in Brussels and then at the International Labour Office. He's the co-founder and the chair of the Fair Wage Network, and he also created and developed the Fair Wage Approach, which you'll find documented in his book, Fair Wages, Strengthening Corporate Social Responsibility. And the Fair Wage Approach has been implemented by a number of brands and leads directly into a certification process. So that's everybody introduced. I'd like to move into some of the structured questions. I'd like to try and get into things. Now, this first one is it's open to everybody. Um, so feel free to tackle this in the order that you like, gentlemen. Now, a lot of attention is being paid to supply chains right now in light of the disruption of the last two years. Um, and there's a majority of businesses now that are working to mitigate risk, remove risk from their international sourcing and manufacturing partnerships. Practically speaking, what does that look like? What does it mean now to really sort of to shore up a supply chain, to protect it against risk? And I'm thinking here from the point of view of brands and retailers, but I'm thinking from the point of view of suppliers as well. So I'll, I'll have a crack at it. Uh, ben, thanks. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, 
I think, you know, the past two years have been really tough. Travel's been limited. Um, and we've seen a, a drop in the number of audits, right, uh, done by international brands and, and retailers, simply because they couldn't gain access. Um, and I think it's a, it's a two-pronged answer, really. I think one, in terms of removing risk, it's about increased transparency and starting to use more tools like um, the HIG framework or the Sustainable Apparel Coalition's um, social and labor convergence. Um, I also think that a lot of successful brands and manufacturers, uh, successful brands and retailers have actually started to marry the, the manufacturers that they work with. Uh, gone are the, the days of transactional business because they just don't work. Um, you need a trusted hand on both sides. Uh, from a brand point of view, you want to make sure that the manufacturer works on exceeding compliances, not just ticking a box and has a proactive strategy for moving forward. But from a, a manufacturer's perspective as well, we want the security that we'll get a fill rate. We'll look at the supply chain as a, a total process. And it's far more collaborative than it's ever been before. Yeah, let me jump in as well. Um, so from my experience working with brands and retailers on, on an advisory side, I've seen the numbers. The numbers have drastically changed. You know, we we had we used to count vendors in, in the hundreds and, and, and in some cases for the biggest ones in the world. You know, it may have been 2,000 suppliers. And what I've seen, certainly over over the last four decades, is those numbers get smaller and smaller. And they've got smaller and smaller because it makes perfect sense to build bridges between suppliers, to engage fully, to become true partners where each side wins, you know, and that's helping suppliers invest in new equipment. You know, go from processes using old equipment to, to new and exciting processes. Let, let's say, for example, I'm going to use an extreme here, but we're going from a wet dye process to a digital dry printed process, direct to roll, where you involve all the different technologies that can print directly on those pieces in a marker and the waste is white instead of the waste being printed those require both sides the brand predominantly the brands but now you know the private label retailers to work with manufacturers to work how how best can we can we deliver this product how, how best can we bring this product to market and now at the same time can we improve the quality and potentially lower cost and do things smarter so i think the last two to three years I've, I've only accelerated that thinking, you know, in the last hour, I've been speaking to one of the biggest retailers in the world who was saying to me, Mark, it's a win-win. It's definitely a win-win for us to work with our suppliers at that depth um, of partnership. And we want to do things right because we know that we can win and we can beat the competition. So let's not be, you know, let's not hide it. They're here to make a profit. They're here to make good products and make profit for the board, for the investors. But why not do that and do it smart and at the same time save money? You know? So maybe Ben, just to, to complement on, on the social side, uh, because I think that it's important to have the global context. And I think that there was an agreement even before the, the recent health crisis that there were global inequalities everywhere and international organizations were attracting the attention of the audience on that. And uh, for the first time, you could see the IMF, a financial institution, saying that global inequalities were bad for growth, for economic growth. And you know what the COVID-19 crisis did, now we know it, it's not that it created really new source of inequalities, but just exacerbated the inequalities that were already existing. So there is something, you know, in the business model that does not really work. 
And I think that um, the crisis uh, could also show, I mean, what were the causes of, you know, this, uh, you know, this uh, global inequalities. And you could see in the crisis, you know, jobs, uh, you know, uh, lost. Uh, you could see that there is a contractual issue. I mean, those on temporary work, you know, were the first to be dismissed and so on. You could see that the brands had disruptions in their supply chain also because of that labor uh, components. And I think that they realized that if they wanted to be strong in their supply chain management, they also had to you know, take care of, uh, of the human uh, side. And I think that now there is a recognition that it's not only a question of you know, reputational risk, it's really a risk to see your supply chain disrupted because of these social inequalities. That's a great point. Thank you very much, Daniel. It kind of brings me on to what I wanted to talk about next, which is it's obviously universally acknowledged or pretty universally acknowledged that fashion needs to take action on when it comes to sustainability. But like I said before, it's clear that sustainability strategies have kind of zeroed in on environmental metrics, the ones that we previously mentioned, the waste, the renewable materials. Why is it you feel that people have been left out of that equation um because you've mentioned some you've kind of hinted at some of the catalysts for change there this is an open question but it makes sense to uh, to go to daniel i think based on what he was just talking about there but what is happening sort of outwardly from the point of view of market forces what's happening inwardly within brands that is changing the conversation now to where the human side the person side, the people side the labor side needs to be represented Yeah, maybe I can I can try to answer that one. I, I think that really um, the the external pressure uh, has been more on, on environmental issues uh, clearly over the last decade uh, because of global warming, international conferences, governments' commitments on uh, you know what to do on environment issues, an international framework uh, around uh, green issues. So clearly there was this pressure on the brands uh, on environmental issues. Also because, you know, clearly the global context was, was not that good. And I think that this changed over time in the sense that um, the different crises, first, I mean, the financial and economic crisis, then, you know, the, the COVID-19 crisis. Now we can see also, you know, this surge of inflation because of the war and so on. All these different elements are showing that uh, it is important indeed, I mean, to look at also the social sustainability side. And I think that here uh, you can see that this is the reason why, you know, international organizations are, you know, making this call, you know, to the private sector. I think there's also a recognition that uh, institutions are not enough. Uh, if you look at the legal minimum wage, for example, you have a gap between the legal minimum wage and the living wage thresholds in almost every country. So you can see that institutions seem not to be enough. So there is this call from international organizations, you know, you can see the UN Global Compact, the OECD, the International Labor Office, you know, really asking the brands to take a part of the responsibility on uh, solving uh, these issues. And it's also interesting to see that the investors are also moving. Now the Dow Jones Sustainability Index uh, has questions on the living wage. They're asking brands to have first a public commitment on the payment of the living wage and also to implement a methodology to pay a living wage in their supply chain. So you can see that um, this call from international organizations, uh, this call from investors um, are really in a way pushing the brands, I mean, to respond. And I think that's you also touch uh, another point which is important, which is you know, the, the, the accessibility of data. You know, it is important to have reliable data, to have uh, relevant methodologies. And I think that now, I mean, we have more and more indicators and data on social sustainability. You know, I'm working on wage issues. Now you have living wage thresholds in uh, all countries. Uh, we have clear indicators uh, behind fair wages. And it is important because the brands can see then that they have a sort of roadmap to follow. You know, there are clear indicators because you're always afraid, right? I mean, 
you know, you touch something that you don't know. And, uh, you know, you never know, I mean, what's going to happen. You know, if you touch in, in, in particular, you know, wage issues, you're going to touch wage costs. So, um, you know, uh, it's going to be, you know, increasing costs, especially in a, in a context which is not favorable and so on. And I think that another final point is the fact that many brands recognize <laughs> there are benefits out of this process. And this is what is uh, making the link, you know, with sustainability. They realize that, you know, if you improve wages, if you improve working time, if you improve working conditions, health and safety conditions, you know, the workers will be more motivated. There will be increased productivity, lower turnover, lower absenteeism, better quality of goods. So these elements are important. And what I can see, I mean, I'm, I'm working with front runners like Unilever, L'Oreal, and I can see that they see the benefits. There are always benefits, you know, from, you know, to catch, you know, for front runners. You know, we saw that in environmental issues. I mean, it's the same, you know, for social issues. But beyond the reputational gains, there's really a business model behind. And this is what is important because this social side was missing, you know, in the sustainability programs of brands. Mm -hmm. That's, that's awesome. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, Mark, Rakil, is there anything you want to add to that one in terms of what's really driving this evolution from material focused, kind of environmental focused, sustainability and towards the humanitarian side of things? I think what Daniel just said was was absolutely right. And the focus is clearly on, you know, it's clearly on the consumer expectations around transparency, around sustainability in the environment, and the pressures coming from top down, from you know large investment corporations, and, and and it's now hit the board for the first time. But I have to say, all that is really positive and the positive steps. But I I still feel that labor isn't really on there yet. I, I, I just don't see it. I, I, I speak to brands and retailers almost on a daily basis. And if I raise the subject, it's raised. I never hear them raise the subject when we're talking about costings. We're talking about technology and, and, and in this case, data transparency. But you know, when I ask them to show me the bill of labor, a lot of times it's, what is that? A lot of times it's not filled in um it it's 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 just not there so i mean i post as much as i can um you know yesterday i put a piece out from the securities and exchange commission that says that public companies will have to uh, disclose the greenhouse gas emissions and and processing of material and components and last month i think i put one out on the New York fashion bill that says any company that's, um, you know, got a revenue over a hundred million has got to now show tiers one, two, three. So uh, factories, mills, components down at that level. And I've made lots of predictions uh, as, as most of the people listening will, will know about, okay, that's step one, but step two has, uh, has got to be labor. And I think that the consumer, who is driving the NGOs, the non-government organizations, you know, fashion revolution, these type of um, organizations, who in turn are then pushing their own politicians and, you know, in our case here in the UK, the MPs, to produce laws and bills that become, um, they become integrated into the, into the, um, into retailers and brands. And, and one such case, um, and is I think the first in the world was the Modern Slavery Act uh, that, that was brought into force here in the UK, which says to you know the, the, the UK retailers and brands that you are responsible for your entire supply chain, tiers one to tiers five, and transparency of labor as well. And even if your products are made in a, in a country outside of the UK, you are ultimately responsible for the, you know, how that product is made and, and the cost and the fairness that goes into it. So I, I, I can only see coming 
a wave of change like this legally as well um, that will, you know, around the world that will make it uh, a legal requirement. I wish it wasn't a legal requirement. I wish that people said, you know, fair, fair living rate is, is somebody that everybody should be able to expect, no matter where they live in the world. Um, so. Perfect. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, we can we can now welcome Stuart McCready Stocks, who uh, I skipped it, glossed over his introduction before. So, uh, but it's it, it's great to have him. Um, I'll do it quickly. Stuart has uh, more than a decade of experience working with brands, sourcing businesses, and apparel manufacturers globally, supporting achievement of strategic goals through the use of technology from startups to multinationals. Stuart's primary goal is to enhance digital collaboration between key stakeholders in the end-to-end -end life cycle of garment design, development, and manufacturer uh, manufacture, delivering against consumer expectations while driving a more sustainable future for fashion. So Stuart, I'm really glad you were able to, uh, to join us. Great to have you. Um, we were going through um, the, the question about why, what the catalysts for change are here, why it is that the sustainability conversation is evolving beyond the planet and starting to take in the humanitarian side and the people, what the, what the catalysts for that are. So um, I'll, uh, you haven't had the opportunity to speak, so I'll give you that chance now. Thank you, Ben. Apologies for that. Quite uh, having technical issues from a technology business is quite embarrassing, but I am now here. So thank you ever so much for being patient with me. Um, I, I'm not sure whether we've already covered this point, so forgive me, but I think that the reality is the catalyst is the consumer. You know, there are things out there that for, for a very long time the consumer has tolerated. They've not fully understood, I think, to the level that we absolutely believe the younger generation of consumers do today. Um, and there's no longer hiding it. There's no, we cannot hide from this anymore. Um, brands have a primary responsibility to ensure that they're doing the right thing. And I think when we think about uh, sustainability, and I'm sure everybody would, would agree with the statement, you know, we, we very naturally think about the planet. You know, we know we as an industry are a very destructive industry to the planet, and there's a huge amount that we can do there. Um, you know, and, and the raw materials that we're pumping into our into our garments, et cetera, et cetera. But very rarely do we start thinking about the people that are involved in the manufacture of our garments. The consumers now do, and we cannot avoid that. So that is the catalyst. Um, I mean, on the back of that, of course, we've had things like the pandemic, which has, of course, brought even more focus to who, where are we making it? Who's making it now? We know that the shutdown of factories and the skills labor that we had was no longer accessible. We had to look at alternative routes to find that. So um, I think a, a collaboration or an aggregate of a collection of things have really brought a true focus. And we know what getting this wrong really means, right? We know the impact and uh, that getting this wrong really means, and there's no avoiding it anymore. And I think you know a lot of us spend a huge amount of time working with um brands to really try and take the lid off what does this mean and i think there's a huge fear around um doing that you know not knowing is is it's painful but actually it's people see knowing as more painful and i think once they believe they start to take the lid off and see what's really there there's a huge amount that they have to do and i think it's our job to really be supportive of the fact that there are steps there are steps that are available today, right now, that is that, that brands have available to them. And, and people like us are here, here to support them. Mark, Daniel, Raquel, we see it all the time, right? Um, and, and I think we need to be making them fully aware of how we can help, what's available to them now, and start to get them on that journey. That's a brilliant point. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, Daniel, I wanted, to, I wanted to ask you a question here um, now. Looking at the fashion transparency index from last year, um, I think less than 1% of the cross-section fashion brands and retailers that were surveyed were either able to or confident enough to disclose how many of their workers were paid what you would define as a living wage. Um, and another major 2021 sustainability index found that there were no brands who were willing to stake a claim in this area. So 
we've just been through the catalyst. We've been through the drivers for why this is changing. And Stuart was very right there to zero in on, on the consumer. There is a clear mandate for brands to be able to disclose this information and want and be capable and to, to build out the data they need to disclose this information. What's your experience? Because I know you're hands-on in this. What's your experience of working with brands in this area? Like, What's the real status of fair labor compensation in the fashion supply chain as it stands today? Yeah, no, I think that you, you're touching a, a very important aspect. Um, you know, why not a greater commitment, you know, on the living wage, for example, from, uh, you know, brands, supplies in this, in this industry? Um, well, clearly here, when you talk about, you know, the labor aspect, especially wages, you touch about costs, okay? And this is a sector where, you know, costs, especially cost on labor, are essential. It's a big part. So clearly, you know, many brands and suppliers are reluctant. And Mark, you said it very well. I mean, you know, there is something that, you know, is, is not responding there. So I think that really, uh, it, it's really a question of, of changing a bit uh, the mindsets. Um, I think that in many cases there has been a sort of race, you know, to the bottom. Uh, we know now that this is, you know, something that, you know, might work in the short term, but it doesn't work in the long term and certainly not, uh, you know, reconciling with uh, sustainability and long term profitability. So I think that there, I mean, it is really important, I mean, to try to explain that investing in labor is not only a cost, it might be a cost, but it's also an investment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we really should deliver this message because when we deliver this message, I can see that, you know, the managers are receptive. You know, if you present, you know, if you go in, in a supply in, in Bangladesh and you say, okay, you know, you have to pay a living wage, they will say, what? I mean, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not part of their world. They're trying to, to survive. Uh, their, their margin are very small and so on. So it is important to explain them, okay, I mean, you see, I mean, if you, if you, if you bring this uh, living wage commitment within uh, stronger human resources, uh, this is why, you know, we have this fair wage framework. We try to touch base systems, um, you know, wages related to skills, related to performance, to make sure that, you know, the way they will increase wages to a living wage will be a sustainable way. So it's really important, I mean, to have this message. And I think the brands can also help a lot because I can see that when the brands commit and they decide, I mean, to have this message among suppliers, uh, they know how to talk to their suppliers and um, they know that this uh, argument about investment, about the business case is also, you know, part of the story and they explain it very well. And I can see that, you know, for example, Unilever now is, 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 is moving you know, to cover their 60,000 suppliers. Well, then, I mean, they, they, you know, they are asking a commitment from their suppliers. The same with L'Oreal. I mean, uh, Apple is now working also on, on the living wage aspects and so on. I mean, many, you know, front runners in every single sector. But it's true that this particular industry, um, you know, is having this, um, you know, black box in terms of wages, wage cost, and it is important I mean, to do something about it. And this leads me to another aspect that uh, we have to, to touch because it's part of the business model. Uh, we were saying that the consumers are not yet present and uh, they should be, and it's true. But for the consumers as well, you're touching about costs. And of course the consumers, especially in periods like this of crisis, they want to buy cheap products and uh, they need them I mean, to keep their, their purchasing uh, power. So, you know, should the payment of a living wage be, you know, transmitted to the consumers or should it be uh, borne by the, you know, by the brands, uh, considering sometimes, you know, the, the margin they have? This is a question mark. And, um, and of course, here, I mean, we're touching about purchasing practices. You know, it's not enough, I mean, to ask suppliers to pay a living wage. It is important to make sure that the prices, the technical specification, the lead times will place the supplies in the optimal conditions to pay a living wage. We just have a study and we, you know, I'm going to publish a book in, in a couple of months 
precisely showing for the first time what, the, what is the exact impact of different purchasing practices on wages, working time, outsourcing, temporary work at the end of the supply chain. And of course, there is a direct impact. So changing the business model is not only to commit to a living wage, is to make sure that the purchasing practices that are put in place will allow suppliers you know, to have a better behavior in terms of uh, wages and working conditions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Daniel. That was a great answer. Um, Stuart and Mark and, you know, anyone, Rick Hill, you can feel free to jump in here as well. But um, building on what Daniel just said, when you start to think about, practically speaking, what it means to, to start to take action on accounting for the labor component of product cost, the labor side of sustainability, that's something that requires specificity it's not something that can be done with averages and abstracts so um mark you held you know i know you have a you have a gsd practitioner card i know you're very you, you've been here firsthand on the on a lot of the the operation measurements uh most time measurement and everything stuart i know you you work work in that area as well between between the two of you and other people feel free to jump in can we look at why internationally recognized labor quantification standards are going to be so important for making measurable progress in this area and as well how does that differ from a code of practice if you like from a handbook from a an, an average what is what does how significant is the change there and why is it so important that it's an objective independently verifiable standard that's used to uh, to make progress in this area well for me, Ben, there is no average. There is, you don't produce an average minute. You produce a standard minute. And when we measure a minute, to give you an idea of detail, we measure a minute down to two thousandths of a minute, not 60 seconds. And it's based on MTM, Motion Time Measurement Foundational pieces that have been around since the 1950s. And, and 60s and, and a, a great deal of work and so I want to make that point that is no average right that 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 the average is out that's the problem is people create times on on the watches and and they build up uh, a, a book or an excel file with operations for that particular factory and the person doing the work is honestly unskilled right they're, they're unskilled the, there's a practice you know when i talk about um time study people jump up straight away and say standard minute values or in the u.s standard allowable minutes sams and smvs rest of the world they mean the same thing but they've not even considered the equation method study and and method study is the first study it, it's how is this person's workspace is it ergonomically fit for work have they got the right light are they using the right machines at the right motor speeds and i can go on and on and on how is the work presented to them and before we even start to consider timing them and then what is the what is the um, average rate in which somebody to performs? What is a hundred percent? What is, you know, people should work at around eighty percent uh, efficiency. And who's measuring that efficiency? And only then, when we get the method right, and then that we put the standard minutes in, um, and we then add all the different operations to arrive at the total standard minute value for a product we go through all the operations that get to that finished product most brands and retailers today around the world have come from being great merchants they buy product most of them say i want that product at ten dollars because i bought it last year at ten dollars and the year before i bought it at nine dollars so i'm I, i'm happy you can up it on a, a dollar they have no idea what goes into that product. It might be that that product actually measured correctly is a 12 minute 
you know, a, a $12 garment, let's say, in terms of the material content and the components and the labor and everything costed. It might be 12 minutes. To them, in the mines, it's, ten, it, it, it's still that $10 garment. No, it's not. And, and that's what we're going to break out of. We've got to end those averages. And I'm going to stay on that, Ben. We've got to end those averages and we've got to get a standard in place. Now, the, the frustrating thing for me as a former work study engineer is that when two companies, a brand and the manufacturer, work together on the operations and they use one standard between the two, they're probably going to actually reduce cost, increase efficiency, increase quality by doing this instead of working against each other uh, as you know merchants that's the wrong approach the smart approach is is to work together and the other thing i think and and raquel please i i i i'd love to get your input on this you know i picked up a piece of paper this morning for for us a, a talk that i'm going to be doing in in the next month and and the it was a specification from the 1990s and on it it said 250 dozen garments we used to work in dozens by the way 250,000 dozen garments on a spec okay we don't have that today we the order quantities have dropped dr dramatically and in the future when we work in this on demand world which is frankly coming it is coming without doubt and when that arrives, the only way we can make that work is by having accurate minutes, not average minutes. There you go. Very well, very well said, Mark. Um, Raquel Stewart, if you guys, you guys want to jump in here, then uh, I know you've got a lot to say. Mark, I, I think we've spoken about this um, a few times, right? I, and I know Stuart, uh, we have definitely. Uh, as a manufacturer, we all we sell is minutes it's a capacity right it's it's that's the finite capacity that we have and it's how do we optimize that to, to des and that comes from design to cost as well as working on the engineering side by having a scientific approach to it you're actually able to understand what your total capacity is and how you fill it in the most strategic way possible right um mark you, you mentioned, uh, I mean, when I joined the business 18, 19 years ago, you know, we were still making 100,000, 150,000 pieces uh, a style. On average now, it's six to 8,000 pieces. So that multiple has come down. Um, the number of style changes a day in, on, a, on any of our factory floors is eight to 10 styles. And when I say a change, we're talking about more than 50% of the characteristics of the silhouette uh, shift. So you could go from making a t-shirt to, to making a pair of sweatpants. And, and that's a big shift in efficiencies, change over time, last time that we talk about. And as a manufacturer, we eat that cost. Um, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we mentioned this before we went live, right? Manufacturing is part art and part science. And when you look at the the end-to-end -end process, when we talk about SMVs most of the time, uh, we actually only talk about the sewing component. Whereas um, when we work with tools like GST costs, we were actually able to factor in the whole process from cutting all the way through to, to a finished garment, which gives you the true time value of, uh, of producing a garment because just because I finished sewing it doesn't mean we've not got associates pressing it, packing it, transporting it to the finished goods warehouse, inspecting it. So there's a, there's a cost to all of that. That's invisible that we don't talk about. And, um, and Raquel, you, sorry to interrupt, but you haven't also mentioned receiving the materials, batching the materials, shade absolutely. batching with batching getting them ready for the spreading machine absolutely you know not even got to cutting yet there are 185 steps right um at a, at a at a holistic level two level three on a process map that you talk about and when you break it down um to tasks you're talking about you know a thousand thousand two hundred um steps all the way through 
And, and at that point, Raquel, just, just to kind of touch on what, what we spoke about previously, the people part of executing those steps is huge. And, and so, yes, when we talk about living wage, the first thing to think people about is how that's an increasing cost. One of the things that Raquel's business does that I really, really love the focus on is how do we, how do we ensure that we are educating, promoting, developing our people? Because one of the primary assumptions when we are when we are executing any of those processes is that we have a qualified, skilled individual that's able to execute that task effectively and efficiently. That optimizes our capacity output uh, uh, um, consumption and it optimizes our output, as well as increase the things you mentioned there, Mark, around quality, et cetera, et cetera. So investing in the people optimizes every single part of the process. Yes, it increases cost, but it increases quality, it increases efficiencies, and it increases output all at the same time. And there's a balance here, which we are not understanding well enough across our industry. We're it just not getting it. It, I, I, it doesn't necessarily increase cost exponentially though, Stuart, right? It it just shifts the, the, the cost. It's only a, a perception of an increase. And um, it, it comes back to what Daniel was talking about, was speaking to us about earlier on training and investing. And if you look at it, uh, you know, apparel, we've always chased the cheapest needle. It's always been about labor arbitrage. We've seen material price hikes from time, um, um, you know, immemorial. But yeah. when we actually look at sewing costs, we've actually seen the costs decrease year on year by double digit percents. And it's only post COVID that we're starting to see this increase again. Uh, the, I think the, the interesting factor here is it's all because of those, because of that price pressure for factories, you're almost whizzing people through you, you, you're training them for a week, 10 days in a, in a training room, and then shifting them straight onto the production, uh, onto the production line. And then the whole concept of evaluation is very subjective. And, and this is what we've been trying to answer, right? We have a great time management tool in, in GSD cost, which builds out how long it should take and all the steps required to make a garment. But how do you measure that? Absolutely. And I think I think, you know, to, to be fair here, what we absolutely see and I see a lot is brands really trying to kind of dip their toe in the water here. So, for example, at the beginning of a season, we know that they start to talk about the cost of a minute. How much am I going to pay per minute for you as a factory to construct my garments? So there's conversations happening. The reality is. And I'm very comfortable with the fact that we're agreeing a cost per minute. That's great. But actually now I think I've got a 12 minute garment, just coming back to Mark's garment earlier on. But in factory, it's taking 17, 18 minutes to produce. One, because we don't have the methodology, the motion, the, you know, the, the methodology correct in factory. Um, but also we don't have the right people in the right places at the right time. Now, a combination of all of those things means that the reality is that this is no longer a 12 minute garment, it's an 18 minute garment. And the price that I agreed per minute at the beginning against a 12 minute garment keeps me in that minimum wage, good payment to my people. Once it starts going from a 12 minute to a 15 minute garment and multiplying it out by my quantity, I am pushing those boundaries. I am now paying under paying labor for this garment and because i have no sight or no understanding of it i am putting myself at risk without truly understanding what's going off and this is the gap that we need to fill this is the gap we need to educate the brands using things like gsd getting into understanding the methodologies and the execution processes so that they understand a 12 minute garment unless i can evidence it's a 12 minute garment i can speak the same language it's not a 12 minute garment it's theoretically a 12 minute garment, but not in that production environment and not under those constraints with that machinery and those people. And that is the difference between putting yourself in a high risk situation or having control, understanding and visibility, knowing you're doing the right thing. And that's what we spend a lot of our time doing. And, and also that sounds really scary, right? And lots of people want to back away from that because that all of a sudden you start opening that up and it becomes a huge task. 
And I'm, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier on. The reality is there are big steps, easy steps that we can make today. Raquel talked about some of them, Mark talked about some of them, that put you in a position of strength, really deep in your level of visibility and understanding without, becoming, without it becoming a minefield. And they're the steps that we need to really try and help support people um, get onto. Perfect. Thank you very much, Stuart. Uh, Daniel, sorry, you like you were going to say something there. You know, just to um, you know, to to participate in this, um, you know, in this debate, because I think that yeah, you're touching one important thing, which is you know, it is important to you know to factor factor in the living wage payment. You see, and this is the reason why. You know, as the Fair Wage Network, you know, uh, Stuart, we were so happy, I mean, to participate, you know, in, in, in Code's tool, because I believe that this is a way to do it. Because in a way, if you don't do it, it's not going to work. Because on the one hand, you ask suppliers to pay a living wage. But if you don't factor in the living wage, you know, at the purchasing practices level, what will happen is that probably you will have the first tier supplier committing to pay a living wage, and then they will subcontract to the second tier and the third tier where, of course, there won't be any living wage payments. And, you know, this is going to happen. You know, I, I did quite a lot of surveys for the luxury sector in Italy, for example. And, you know, the first tier looks, you know, pretty okay. Uh, modern factories, uh, you know, payment according to the sectorial collective agreement, so okay. But then, of course, you subcontract to the second tier until, you know, uh, you know, so the, the home workers who are, you know, sometimes in a very precarious uh, situation. So it is important to make sure that it's going to be part of purchasing practices. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's going to be only, you know, a race to the bottom, you know, towards the end of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. And you will have clearly vulnerabilities at the end of the chain. No, that's a great point. Thank you, Dana. And I mean, the question that comes to my mind is, um, okay, so we, we have a, we have an objective quantifiable labor standard. Um, what does it mean to then operationalize that for one of a better word? Um, so having those objective units, that matters a lot, but there's more, there's more to adopting a common language for measuring and standardizing than just having the standards. So what kind of structures and tools do brands and their supply chain partners, that relationship, what do they need to put in place to really start to factor in that true cost, not that guess, is it, is it a 12 minute garment, the, the actual knowledge, what do they have to build around that? What structures do they need to build around that to, systematize it, operationalize it in a way that then informs the people who are conducting sourcing it. It can go on to inform design, it can go on to inform development. It's taking that standardization and making it useful and surfacing that data beyond the, the, the initial needle point. Like what, what does it mean to build stuff around it? Ben, I'm going to jump in here because I think Please. for me, um, Technology plays a big part here. And, and I would say to brands and retailers who, who are listening live or get to listen to this after the event, um, the, one of the first things they need to do is, is to accept the standard minute approach, a fair, a fair standard minute, right? That that is happening. But rather than being forced into that with legislation and the consumer who made my clothes, then accept it, onboard it. By onboarding it, you, you need to put softwares in place, right? So if, if for example, we, we've talked a lot about GST, but let's say I'm a footwear company, then it, it's timeline, part of Sartre, Sartre's son. For, for footwear. So we've got apparel clothing, we've got footwear. We, we even have, um, MTM for other operations that are outside manufacturing um, of, of apparel and footwear. So there are other systems. So the, there are several different standard technology systems that support consumer product goods. In, in, in uh, L'Oreal's case, um, it's, it's also apparel, 
specific tools like GSD or or or, or timeline for footwork, right? So that that's that. So it's it's accepting it, it's engaging in it, it's bringing these tools in, and it's bringing the expertise in house. Then I would say, and I'm going to be bold about this: stop being merchants. Stop saying, "Well, I bought it last year at this this dollar rate," and start to engage in the operations that build take the style build the operations and why not in in this future that we live in today and that is 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 growing build synthetic cost without even building the samples in this 3d virtual world where we can use technology to take the seam lengths and seam types and the different components and build a cost literally against a 3d avatar where we then have the cost and we're not saying to rackle and his team make me another sample make me another sample give me another cost we can put five more belt loops on on the waistband and say what is the cost because we know the cost of each of the belt loops or we can do different di different styling and so on and we arrive at a cost and then it would be ideal then to engage in a conversation with you know a company like Hydromani and say, this is a cost we've built based on this style. Are we aligned here or is there a challenge? And, and Michael says, well, you've done this, but this operation actually uses this type of machine. We don't have that type of machine, so we can do it slightly differently, but it's gonna up the cost by a, a, another minute or whatever that might be. And it's then that we can build style and quality and we can manage the future on demand with accuracy. We're not guessing because acting like merchants, when we say we're placing the order for a hundred thousand garments across these, you know, sizes, across these colors and so on, because we don't truly know the time, we don't know when we're really going to get those garments. Mm -hmm. we're, we're guessing when we're actually going to get them. So then when the supply is late, because it takes more time, what do we do next? We penalize them, we start fining them for being late, for trying to do a good job. So the sooner the two engage, the sooner we can do some really good things for the world, the sooner we can engage in new software. I mean, there's some amazing um, applications that could be implemented, but people are just, they, they take a garment or a specification and say, over to you well, we've got this great piece of machinery that could do this faster. No, 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 we, we just wanted it, that, that, that $10, please. Mm -hmm. Yet in the, in the suggested world, we'd actually talk about introducing those new technologies faster because actually they dealt both, yeah. both sides uh, of the equation. Okay, um, yeah. Stuart, I've got I've come to you on this one because I know you and I have previously had a conversation about the importance of doing something with data once you surface it once you make it available to people and what we're talking about here is is gathering objective information yes but it's about bringing that up and then and then determining how you act on that um so do you do you want to add something there yeah yeah absolutely and i think mark's absolutely spot on here um and it's not about embedding technology in one part of the supply chain it's about having the right pieces in the right place so that we can then aggregate that data and let me just talk about a couple of examples of this um and, and kind of come back to, to to mark's point when i work with with brands and retailers about how they cost there's primarily two different routes that they do this on one is that they then they they themselves try to create a target costing which they then want other vendors or factories to be able to match the level of detail about how we get to that number or that cost I'm going to say sketchy at best, right? But, and there's a whole education process that we need to go on to help them get to a point where actually that is a really good quality, accurate target number, which we know is reliable and responsible. The other way is that we do exactly as Mark just said, throw the specs over the fence to the vendors and say, can you give me a quote, please? Give me a price on that. We then look at all of the submissions from the vendors and we say, okay, that vendor's five cents cheaper than that vendor. So we're going to haggle. We're going to we're going to be merchants. We're going to try and get this to a point where we can get a cheap price, the cheapest one we can get, that's in line with our expectations. But there's no benchmark other than historic data. Historic data, as we all know, 
is no good. It had it had its time and its place. In the in the the world that we live in today, what happened yesterday, the week before, the month before, the year before is not valid anymore. Those benchmarks need to change. That mindset that we can use that historic data has to change. So what we try to do, and, and Rakil does this day in, day out, is put the right technology assets in the right place. And where we do that, and if I think about, I'm going to say best in breed. Best in breed was a great concept where we put technologies in that kind of had maybe a narrow but deep footprint. And they were there to look after and assess and address a particular challenge. That created islands of data, silos of data that created and handled and managed that problem. The reality is the information that's, that, that, that we've collected as part of resolving that problem actually is one of the key pieces of data that we need for making decisions over here. But there's no way to be able to get it. One of the things that I hear a lot, data is king. And you're right, I actually don't think there's a shortage of data. I think that actually there's more data than people know what to do with. And actually what we need to do is help these understand where those data references are, how do we aggregate them, how do we visualize it, and how do we support making those correct decisions? So again, just coming back to a very, very good example, if we, if we all decide that we're going to use a technology to be able to design to manufacture, what we then need to be able to do is follow that through to execution. Once we've executed that design in that manufacturing environment, and we know there are many different ones to come back to some of what Mark was saying earlier on, how are we then assessing what those differences are and being able to learn from them? So next time we put the, we, we, we do this journey with something slightly different, we're surfacing that. And I think some of the stuff that, that Mark talked around, around kind of, you know, beating each other up about a sense here and a dollar there. The reality is that the only way we actually get to a point where everybody is profitable, strategically aligned in the goals here is by removing those barriers of communication, visibility, transparency. But the history of this industry in particular is the second you start, do, you start doing that, people try to hold on to their share and a greater share. They believe there's a greater share of margin to be making here. I want to hold it. And the reality is, again, you know, going back to a 12 minute garment, my target is for my vendors to make a 12 minute garment. I'm comfortable at 12 minutes. Everybody's being paid a fair wage. We have the right methodologies in place, the right technologies in place. If you guys can make it in 11 minutes, you hold on to that profit. You reinvest it in your people. You reinvest it in the technology infrastructure that will allow me to see how you're executing it well so that I can share that with my other vendors. Because if you're doing something great, so can they. Let's learn from each other. Let's be more transparent and more visible. And that's a big culture change. I mean, I like to think that I'm, you know, a newbie in this industry. I'm still really young. Yeah. But I've been here 10 years. And I can honestly say in the 10 years that I've been here, the difference from 10 years ago to now is massive in one respect. But actually, it still holds on to a lot of that historic. If I'm too visible, I'm going to get beaten up a little bit. And I'm not, you know, nobody's going to be saying to me, pump that money back into your own business. And that's what needs to change. And I'm sure see Rick Hill nodding, right? It's it's a it's a it's a hard world, but we will only get there if we collaborate. And talking to to, to Mark's point, it has to be right technologies, right places, aggregating of da data, surfacing it in the correct way, identify where we do it well, and share share that with the rest of the supply chain. It doesn't mean you're losing your commercial advantage. What it means is that you're positioning our industry better. The more we can do this, the better we, we can we can we can support the future of this yep. industry, you know, and it's based it at a tech level. The fundamentals are getting the right tech in the right place. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Stuart. Um, and the, pa the passion around the table is evident from uh, from everybody here. Um, we will, uh, we're, we're running over time. We started a little bit late. Uh, I know Daniel needs to dip out, but, um, you know, Stuart, Mark, Rakeel, if you've got a sentence or two each to, because we've got some interesting, an interesting mix of brands and retailers in the audience today. If you've got a sentence or two each about steps that, that they can take today 
to make to start to make a difference it doesn't have to necessarily be measurable right away it doesn't necessarily have to be comprehensive right away but how can they start to move in the right direction to begin bringing people to their rightful place at the heart of sustainability strategies mark i'll ask you first because you're on the furthest on the left for me I think you might be are you muted, right? Sorry, you were. <laughs> so the first thing is my call out here is for brands and retailers to use a fair and legal st recognized standard to produce those minutes and not somebody's wristwatch or some old operation files that they've got. And I'm going to finish with one more point. And my second point is, we'll stay on anchor on to this 12 minute garment theory. This 12 minute garment is maybe 12 minutes and it gets converted at a rate for a particular country or down to a particular region or city in that country. You can't ha be sourcing products and say, this is a 12 minute garment this is coming from Myanmar, this is coming from Vietnam, this is coming from China, so they're all identical prices. No, they're not. There'll be different conversions, different labor uh, costs, there'll be different machinery types. So that 12 minute doesn't necessarily translate equally. So brands and retailers have got to accept that they need to get the accurate prices, they may standardize on one average for costing purposes and for their own way of calculating, but that that happens in the world, that's real. Perfect, thank you. Um, Daniel, I know you said you're short on time. If you've, if you've got a second for a sentence, we'll, uh, we'll take it, but if not, don't worry. Sure, no, I didn't want to, to leave without, you know, a last message, um, you know, to the companies, brands that are listening to us, I think that, you know, I would like to tell them, don't be on the defensive side, um, don't be afraid, you know, of, uh, you know, engaging in social sustainability, especially, you know, on, on the living wage, wage issues, working conditions. You know, sometimes I can see brands, they were quite, you know, afraid of starting the process, then, you know, they were you know, positively surprised. They saw, wow, in the end, we're not that bad. And mm -hmm. progressively, step by step, they started with their own employees and then with their suppliers. And uh, we always try, I mean, to present this not as an audit, but more as an assessment and remediation to help them in this process, to find the root causes and to remediate. So, and, you know, at the end, you know, uh, we have this certification process, which in a way is, uh, you know, is um, is a label of of quality uh, in the in social sustainability, which I believe uh, can uh, you know be an important uh, element in their you know uh, supply chain management and also quite um, you know quite important for the suppliers themselves because uh, they are looking at these things as well. Perfect. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you for joining us. Um, Thanks a Rikil. lot. Eh? Yeah, absolutely. It's been a pleasure to have you. Uh, Rikil, uh, a couple yeah. of sentences or two from you, if you don't mind. Sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ben. You know, I think for too long, we've um, we've actually focused on intake margin and not on sell-through. And that's where the value really can be created, because if we collaborate more with um, with our brands and retailers that we work with, we can actually focus on the end-to-end -end supply chain involve the tier two, tier three suppliers as well. Um, pay us all a little bit more, but sell more at full price. I think that's where the, the real value comes out. Um, we've, we've worked with a couple of the brand partners uh, to date, and we've seen our volumes go up with them. We've seen our prices go up with them, but their sell throw and margin has improved as well. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, and Stuart, you're the, only, you're the only one who hasn't had their turn. Thanks. I, I'm actually going to echo a lot of what Daniel said, um, as well as Raquel here. Um, there is a balance to be had across all of these, and it is scary. There's nothing to be afraid of. I think what we as Coates Digital, in collaboration with Daniel and the Fair Wage Network, have, have been able to create 
is a very simple, easy tool to give you a huge amount more visibility as a retailer, as a brand, to understand what's really happening. And you don't need to go down into the, you know, into the weeds and get distracted by the complexities. There are simple and easy ways to be able to get a reasonable, if not good quality, a visibility and understanding of what you're buying, what it should cost and where you should buy it from. The only other thing that I would add is that on top of the um, optimizing your sell through, which is something that, that people are, are absolutely trying to do much more of now, um, not only from a re waste reduction perspective, but from a, a, a margin erosion perspective, but actually sourcing strategies are really key. Sourcing strategies are huge, but you can't build a good sourcing strategy on theories. It has to be on accurate detail, detailed and accurate costings. You know, without those, your sourcing strategies, unfortunately, will never be as powerful as they could be. Perfect. It's a strong message to end, end on, but uh, it's, a, it's, it, it's a great one. Um, Mark, Rakil, Stuart, thank you for joining me today. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you on. Um, everyone in the audience, thank you. Thank you for joining as well. We'll be making the recording of this session available um, very, very shortly, as soon as, soon as we can. We'll, we'll coordinate that with, uh, with everyone. And um, so if you're, if you're watching this live, thank you for coming. If you're watching this recorded, um, I hope you enjoy it. And thanks again to all my panel members. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks, man. Thank you. Bye-bye.